Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Offrey. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being uh, here with us today. And the topic today is uh, confronting medical error, and more specific, specifically, uh, the book titled When We Do Harm, authored by Dr. Danielle Ofri. And uh, she is an attending physician at Bellevue Hospital and clinical professor of medicine at New York University School of Medicine. Over 20 years of experience and a parent. Um, she has authored over, uh, uh, she's authored six books and contributes to the New York Times. And you may have seen her on uh, NPR or even read some of your uh, articles um, in the LA Times. But uh, Dr. Ofer, that's a short introduction. Um, would you like to add anything in regard to your, your work and your experience? Sure. Well, so my day job, I'm a primary care doctor at Bellevue, which is the oldest public hospital in the U.S. And so I see patients from all walks of life and with all medical conditions. And then on the side, I edit the Bellevue Literary Review, BLR, which is our mm -hmm. literary magazine. And we publish fiction, poetry, and nonfiction about health, healing, and illness. So I sort of spend my side time reading poetry and fiction on that. And then I also am a cello student. So I've got my... Uh, chill lesson coming up uh, on the weekends. So I got to mm. practice every night. And yes, I've got three teenagers. So uh, <laughs> that keeps me a little, both grounded and a little frazzled. I'm, I'm marveled by your work because you're able to juggle your professional life, your uh, <laughs> home life, and then you have time somehow to, to author six books. Um, and I just finished When We Do Harm. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, and I think it's a real benefit to patients all over the world. Uh, and, and uh, practitioners, uh, anyone in the uh, healthcare uh, related uh, industry. So with that said, what was your inspiration for writing the book? Yeah, well, I was, um, so, so I work with Beacon Press, my, my uh, publishing house. And, you know, when you're the only doctor in a publishing house full of English majors, you get everyone's question, medical questions, everything, you know, their grandmother's atrial fibrillation. And um, anyway, so one day my um, editor sent me this article she saw in the Boston Globe from a, a mm -hmm. paper. And it said, you know, medical error is the third leading cause of death. And she said to me, is this really true? And, mm -hmm. you know, I was a bit taken aback because the truth is I wasn't sure. You know, I work in a busy city hospital, and if medical error is number three after heart disease and cancer, I should be seeing it every single day, and, and, and I don't, or it feels like I don't. So then I kind of wondered, well, um, are those data wrong? Like maybe it's there, that paper's not true, or maybe it is true, and we simply have blinders on. And kind of figuring out which way, you know, the coin would fall became the inspiration for starting this book. And, and who is the book intended for? Because me as a patient, uh, I, I found it very beneficial, but who, who is the book intended for? Well, it's intended for a, a general audience. And, and my goal is to address, address both the lay public and medical professionals, uh, which is sometimes a bit of a balancing act to try and thread that needle to something that will both, you know, uh, not uh, condescend to non-medical folks, but will not be too basic for medical folks. So I try to balance both. And I want um, the general public to be able to sort of understand what goes on behind the scenes and get a sense of, you know, what happens behind the curtain in a hospital and in a medical practice. But I also want doctors and nurses to be able to see uh, a reflection of what they do, but also understand the patient's perspective. And, and the other thing is that we're all patients, right? Even doctors and nurses, we will always be and will soon be, if we're not, not now, a patient at some point. And as soon as one has the tables turned, I, I think it's quite an educational experience, if not harrowing. And you dissect this claim uh, that was written that medical error is the third leading cause of death. Um, and, and that really jumps out and grabs people's attention. It's a shock. But you dissect it further. So can you tell us a little bit more about just so, so, where does medical error rank in regard to right, right. positive and, and I think, you know, not to be a, a spoiler here, but I don't think we'll ever be able to answer that question fully. And, and there's a number of reasons why not. So the first is it can be very hard to define what is a medical error. I mean, that seems obvious from the outset, but it actually isn't. You know, listen, the surgeon chops off the wrong leg. Okay, we know that's an error. But what if you... Um, uh, 
if a patient goes for a CAT scan and, and ends up in, in kidney failure from the contrast dye, well, that wasn't necessarily an error, but it was certainly a patient harm. So um, we don't always know, you know, we're starting a medication at the wrong dose. Is that an error or judgment call? So that's one problem. What exactly is an error? It, it can be very vague. Um, and then what errors cause death? That's actually even harder to prove mm -hmm. because most of these patients who die of medical errors themselves are very sick and sick patients have many moving parts. So for example, a patient um, who is dying of liver failure of cirrhosis is given the wrong mm -hmm. antibiotic, right? That's an error and the patient dies. But did the error cause the death? That's very true. Uh, and sometimes it's impossible because so many things are going on. The patient already has cirrhosis and they're dying of that as well. Did the wrong medication hasten the death, cause the death? We don't know. Third is that there's no place on a death certificate to check medical error involved. So gathering the data is very difficult. And, and so um, the number is very hard to, to tell. And, and the other thing I'll add is that most of these studies, and, and this study, um, this they got a lot of press, was not an original study. It didn't go and look at charts and go into ORs and emergency rooms. It, it reanalyzed other studies, which is not unkosher. But, um, you know, when you, um, any biases in those earlier studies will then get magnified. If you multiply it out to a whole population, any small, you know, errors in the data will be multiplied. And, and, um, and those original studies only use hospitalized patients. And that's not a general public study. And hospitalized patients are very different from the average public. They're much older, they're much sicker, they're hospitalized for goodness mm -hmm. sake. And so their error rate will not necessarily translate to the average population. So very hard to know. So what's the mm -hmm. final answer? It's probably not number three, um, but it's probably not a small number. So even mm -hmm. if we can't precisely get that number, it's still big enough. And the idea that it's not just errors we're concerned about, but all forms of patient harm, right? A patient who gets a, um, a pressure ulcer, you know, from being in bed, is that an error? No, but it's certainly a harm. So we maybe we can stop, um, you know, nitpicking about whether it's actually an error, but if the patient's harmed, that's something that shouldn't be happening. And so looking at the larger sort of field of patient harm and preventing that and kind of shifting the whole field more safe, more safely is really our goal. So I hope that doesn't quite answer mm -hmm. your question perfectly, but that's really where the state of affairs stands. And I think we'll even dive into it deeper as we continue our conversation here. But one thing that's evident and clear when reading your book is your authenticity and really call to attention that's saying, in fact, there is a problem uh, within healthcare. Uh, whether it's third leading cause of death or less, uh, you're still saying there's a problem. Um, so the question is, what has the response to you calling this problem out been within, say, not only in the medical community, but even with patients? Uh, actually, it's, it's been it's been fairly good. I think that people recognize there's a problem. I don't think anyone's pretending there isn't a problem. And maybe we disagree in the magnitude. Um, I think we often um, are uncomfortable about is looking deep within ourselves. The idea that we as medical professionals may be harming our patients is a very hard nut to swallow. I think that most people who go into medicine and nursing these days go in for the right reasons. They're not in it for the fame and glory and money. I think they're in it to help patients. And so if a patient is harmed at their hands, it's devastating. So it's very uncomfortable to, to look at that and think, hmm, have we been causing our patients harm. So it's just not something we enjoy doing. There are much more fun things in life than looking at how we fall short. So there's that aspect. On the other hand, I think we recognize, and certainly patients recognize that and, and are really actively lobbying for medical care has to be safer because patients, you know, you go into a hospital and, and you're kind of at the mercy, you know, even if you're a medical professional yourself, and, and you know, you are now in the vulnerable position. You're the one in the bed, in the gown, you're the one in pain or frightened or, 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 you know, unknowing of what's happening. And so it's impossible, even if you're some powerful bank executive, once you're in the patient chair, you lose all your strength and power. And so we feel like we're at the mercy of the system and we can't really control it. So for the patient side, uh, patient, people are very interested in reforming the system and the medical system, we're, we're coming around to it despite our discomfort, we're, we're getting there, you know, a bit by bit. And, and you actually kind of dissect why this, this problem is as prevalent as it is, and you start to uncover some of the reasons. And one of the reasons is uncovering the system is a problem. Flaws 
in the system. For example, the naming of products or design flaws like the hose fittings or the constant alerts in a hospital, which number you uh, state two and a half million alerts per month. Uh, but can you elaborate just on this topic a little bit as sure. far as the system is a problem? Right. So and I think we often think about, oh, a mistake happens. That must be a really bad nurse or a terrible doctor who did that really wrong thing. And occasionally it is. And those people should probably be sued and lose their license. But that's actually quite rare. Yet you know, we do have and I won't hide that fact. But that's actually not the most common kind of error. The, the most common, you know, sort of category of errors is the very committed, smart, caring professional overwhelmed in a system that is designed to make it very difficult. Uh, I'm not going to say designed to do that, whose design um, flaws make it very hard to function. So I'm a primary care doctor. I was seeing patients yesterday. There's so many things in the electronic medical record to do the EMR that you, it's very hard to focus on the patient. For me to get done, in the amount of time I'm allotted because I have more patients waiting, it's simply not possible to do the thorough chart review. I mean, it could take me 30 minutes. If I, for a complex patient, I could spend 30 before I even see the patient. That kind of time isn't allotted. So what usually happens is on the fly with the patient, I'm quickly going back through that while I'm talking to the patient, my phone's ringing and someone's paging me. So the constant distractions make it very difficult to focus. The alerts are constantly coming up. And, and as you alluded to, we have so many alerts, most of which are false alarms. So I was prescribing medications for a patient and every medication pulls up a ton of alerts. And a lot of them are useless. Like I keep getting alerts about lactation and pregnancy concerns and a patient who's 65 years old. That is really unlikely they're gonna be pregnant or breastfeeding at that age. But because someone didn't mark, you know, postmenopausal somewhere in the chart, it comes up for everyone, you know, uh, who's female, who's marked female will come up. And at times it's helpful, at times it's not. Now buried in there are some important ones, but at some point you just sort of, you know, X them out to go away. I mean, I tried once to read every single alert because there are important ones there. I was defeated by the first patient. You know, there are just dozens and dozens of them. And, and um, in an intensive care unit, an alarm goes off every time, you know, something is wrong with the vital signs, which of course we wanna know. But if the patient's, you know, EKG lead falls off, that's the same alert as a flat line. And that's not always the situation. There should be a way to distinguish those things. And of course, the nurses, you know, start to tune them out because the patient rolls over or scratches their nose. And of course, there have been deaths attributed to people not noticing an alarm or paying attention. So the technology, and you mentioned the hoses, you know, there was always an issue in the operating room that people would mix up the oxygen and nitrogen hoses and patients would die. So they said, well, let's color code the hose so you can see red and blue, um, but the mistakes still happen. But finally someone said, let's make them different sizes. So it can't actually fit on the wrong thing. So you, you can do things that you don't have to expend your brain space with it's a red or it's a blue. If it fits, it works. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. Like our food processor, right? You can't turn it on if it's not locked. So if it doesn't turn on, you know it hasn't been locked. And, and I think there's lots of room for that because right now, <laughs> Our system, you know, asks people to function at a very high level in circumstances that are just, you know, it's, it's like, you know, being in, in one of these frenzied, you know, battleground situations and trying to make life or death decisions. So we have a lot of work to do in the system to, to help us to make errors less likely. And that's really possible to do. I mean, it takes an investment, time, money, resources that people don't always want to do. But I think we could make medicine a lot safer just working on, on that aspect. Yeah, you bring up the change of the sizing for the hose for the nitrogen and oxygen. It seems like common sense, and it would have been right. caught early on. Right, uh, it takes a long but, time to notice that. You know, as you mentioned, look alike yeah. and sound like medications. That happens all the time, and we can solve those. We can make bottles different sizes. Why? Why should things that sound alike, you know, also look alike? You know. Mm. You know, heparin, a blood thinner, is used at two different concentrations, either to um, make an IV, you know, um, just clear it or to treat someone who's got a blood clot. Well, they're very different. And you could make, and they get mixed up a lot, you could make them just different physical sizes so you can't grab the wrong one. It will feel different. It just has to be done. So design being part of the problem, you mentioned also a shift in culture, the way medicine is practiced. And you bring up two points, one being humility and the other collaboration. Can you share more about that? 
You know, what, one of the things that, and, and I think this really holds for our, you know, political leadership as well, but we talk about intellectual humility is to recognize that so often we don't know. And, and that's not a comfortable stance, I think, for many people in, in medicine. You know, we're used to knowing, we're smart, we all are at the top of our class, we competed to get into medical school and nursing school. So we're already used to being the ones in the know. Um, and so we often, if there's a question that comes up, we have an answer, but but often that answer can be wrong. And, and, and patients' medical situations aren't as clear as textbooks. You know, patients don't come in and have you know vasculitis written across their chest. They come and saying, "I don't feel good," right? And that's we have to figure out of the many things can make you not feel good, and we can be wrong. And I think, and and that we sometimes jump to a conclusion too quickly. Then we go down that pathway. And we never we miss the clues that we could have made a mistake. So the being more comfortable admitting when we don't know, hmm, it could be this. I may not be right. Well, trying this, I think, can help us keep an open mind to the idea of, of diagnostic error. You know, we talked a lot of things we spoke about before are more like treatment errors, but diagnostic error, making the correct or incorrect diagnosis is a very difficult uh, area because it's it's always hard to know when you're right or when you're wrong. And so part of how we are more are less likely to be wrong is that we're, if we keep a humble stance that I think it's this, but it could be this, this or that, and I can't afford to miss that. So let me keep my mind open to these larger uh, you know, possibilities. And then the second thing is is the collaboration, and I, and I think many of us trained in an era of that it was like the the lone you know strong powerful doctor or nurse who took everything on um, and did everything and and that's not really possible now. I mean our patients are much sicker, they're discharged from the hospital sooner. We're managing many more chronic issues uh, and acute issues on an outpatient, and it can't be done by one person. And I think when we do, it, it's just a setup for for forgetting things, mistakes, and so. Having a real team where we, you know, we can work together is a way. So you know, maybe the physician is addressing these issues, but the nurses catches those ones, and the nutritionist catches those ones, and there's a social worker there too who catches those issues. I mean, if you are sending the patient home with dressing changes, but the patient doesn't have a home or lives on a walk up and can't get there, your treatment plan is not going to work, and the patient will be harmed. And so you need all these members of the team with their expertise um, to work in a way, and they have to be listened to. You know, medicine has a very hierarchical history. You know, you always have the, the department chair and the senior faculty and the junior faculty and the nurse and the medical student, and no one wants to speak up, you know, above their station. And that's really damaging to patients because often to people on the quote low end, the person who's pushing the gurney who notices, oh, you know, there's something mm -hmm. going on there. Or the medical student is the one who takes the time to speak to patients who catches mm -hmm. the clue that's missed but is afraid to say something. So I think helping our teams recognize that we all have something to bring to the table. We have different skills and different training, but there's validity to it all and to take it seriously and not to discount things because someone is at a different position or a different level of training. Yeah, you talk about kind of the culture of subordination where there's the nurse that does not speak up. Uh, you, you cite some examples, but how do you overcome that? So that has to start at the top. Right. Because everyone who's tried to speak out and, you know, and gone slammed will know. And I'll tell you an example from when I was a medical student, I trained during the height of the AIDS epidemic. So it was a very fearful time. And I was in the operating room holding an organ. I don't even remember what the surgery was. But in the middle of the surgery, um, I got pierced by a needle, by the surgeon's needle. Um, and I, I remember there was this shocking thing. I got this, you know, needle stick. I could feel it. And nobody said a thing. Not the nurse, not the doctor. And I was thinking, did they see? Did they not see? And to let you know that I stood there with my hands, with a needle stick submerged in blood for an hour at the height of the AIDS epidemic because I was not able to speak up, lets you know the power of hierarchy. I was terrified, quaking in my shoes. I didn't know what to do. And no one said, are you okay? Did anything happen? No one. And I didn't feel empowered to speak up. Um, and that's, of course, it's crazy. I should have spoken up right away and, and, and gotten this, this needle stick injury attended to. But that lets you know how strong the hierarchy is. So it has to come from mm -hmm. the top that the chair of the department, the director of nursing, the lead surgeon says, OK, if anything goes wrong, I want you to tell me. It's your job to tell me. If you don't tell me, I'll be upset. And, and um, the leadership talks about their own errors. What happens when, when I made a mistake as chair of medicine or as the chief of nursing? Here's what I did. And so when you have your mistake or problem, 
I want you, I expect you to speak up because it's on behalf of the patient. If you don't speak up and the patient is harmed, that's the problem. And if you ever get retaliated, I'll have your back and, and actually do that and not just have a few words. Mm, that must have been one of the longest hours of your life, right? Oh my goodness. And I eventually, you know, I, I remember after the surgery, I was looking at the patient's chart, trying to figure out how high or low risk the patient was. Mm -hmm. It turned out the patient herself was a nurse from the Bronx. And I went mm -hmm. to her room to, the next day to try and mm -hmm. kind of broach the issue, like would she get an HIV test? I ended up bursting out in tears. She was mm -hmm. hugging me and comforting me as I sobbed in her arms. I was so terrified. And mm -hmm. she took a test and she was negative and I was negative, but boy, it was really scary. And, and um, no one in our hierarchy, you know, I mean, thank goodness the patient was so magnanimous and, and so generous. Um, otherwise, it, it could have been uh, much worse, I think. So let's skip forward to when the error does happen. And you cite Denmark as how they uh, respond to error. And you cite two words that I think are really powerful, and that's acknowledge and apologize. You know, you know, one of the things that we have to, um, that overlays our system of addressing medical error is our malpractice system. And that is somewhat uniquely American in that we use the court system um, as a way to redress harm. And that makes sense in some cases, you know, if a patient has been grievously injured by someone who was negligent, that, that makes sense. But there's a couple of problems with that. So one is that very few patients will ever get to a courtroom, right? because in order for a case to be taken, um, the lawyer has to prove several things. One, that an error or you know harm w had occurred, right? that's important, and that um, the the doctor or the hospital did it. That was the cause of it, right? And, and and that's also very hard. The patient may have been harmed, but can you prove that someone did something? And then the third thing is, is that the consequence is big enough, grave enough, to um, initiate a, a payment big enough to make it worth the cost of the case because the cases are very expensive. So if you were harmed, but all you had is a broken fingernail, no one's going to pay you out the money to, to cover the lawyer, cover the, the witnesses, to cover all the things that come in. So it has to be a grievous harm and you have to prove the, the causality. So it's very hard. So in, in practice, most lawyers will say they turn away 95 or more percent of cases that come to them. So only very few patients are actually helped by the system. Everyone else is just stuck. That's one problem. Uh, and the second is that it, it doesn't actually help the patients who were harmed when there wasn't an error, you know, like the patient who got the bad pressure ulcer. And so what, what Denmark did is they decided to sort of scrap the malpractice system, except for the true negligence, you know, the intoxicated doctor who commits harm. That That's criminal, and that goes there. But for everyone else, if the patient is harmed, they could simply file um, a report in a patient compensation system which is for Americans, the way to think of it is workers' compensation, right? If, if someone is harmed on a job, they can then file a claim and the claim is adjudicated by, you know, some board with a set of standards of what, you know, makes the case or not. And if it seems like they were harmed by their job, they get some kind of payment, whether or not the harm was intentional or not. And so Denmark does the same thing for medical issues. Whether or not it was an error or, or direct or intended or not, if the patient received harm from their care, they're entitled to compensation. And, and the upside is that it's very quick. It's very easy. You file a one-page thing. Even the doctor can file it. And it's very quick. In America, it can take years. These cases can drag on, you know, four, five, ten years. Um, they're excruciating expensive. In Denmark, it's a matter of, of weeks to months. And, you know, you get a, a modest payout, but you get something. And of course, Denmark has a much stronger safety net, so you're not bankrupted by, by your bills. And the other crucial thing is that information filed there cannot be used in a court of law. So the doctor should feel comfortable if they see the patient was harmed to help, to help the process because they're not worried they're going to get sued by assisting the patient or acknowledging it or apologizing. And for many patients, what they really... Uh, seek is some acknowledgement that something happened, a recognition, and, and an apology, if it's sincere, matters a lot. And of course, some restitution. If they were injured such that they can't work, well, then they need some financial restitution to help them because they can't do their job any longer. But in America, we're so nervous that if we acknowledge or apologize, oh, we're going to be considered liable, we'll be sued, you know, and our lives will be destroyed. So we're very hesitant in America because of the legal system. Mm -hmm. Seems like good common sense. Just, I think a lot of patients, when they are harmed, uh, as a real sincere acknowledgement and apology, and 
maybe just even a small amount of money would really create more harmony within for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and some there's some experiments in the U.S. with these with you know these restitution processes, um, and it, it's on a small scale. And I think it has the the potential. The problem is a little bit of culture in America. We have this idea of you know trial by jury of your day in court, which is really nice in theory. But again, 95% of patients never get their day in court, so it's only great for those few. Uh, and even for those few, it's a miserable experience. You ask anyone who's been through the process, even if they quote win in the end it's exhausting, painful, you know, emotionally just scarring for the patients and the doctor, no matter who wins in the end, it's an incredibly painful process that doesn't undo the error anyway. And I think most people would want to shift to a less litigious system, except perhaps the lawyers, for, and, and not to cast all aspersions on lawyers, um, but, you know, who's making the laws about this? That That is our Congress, our leaders, and, and, and who are they? Mostly lawyers. And so they have a vested interest, I think, in this system. Um, and uh, and and I think many lawyers are working out of the goodness of their heart, but still, it's a system that that if you didn't have that would wouldn't you know benefit the legal system as much. So there is a bit of an I think underlying agenda that keeps this going. For those listening, there may be a patient who is listening because they were harmed. What is recourse for a patient in the United States if they have been harmed? Well, there's you know there's many possible things. So the first thing is to try and talk to your doctor or nurse. Now, they might be cagey in a nervous place, but uh, it's certainly a reasonable start. And you may say, listen, I'm not looking to have a fight. I just want to know what's going on. Um, every hospital, every medical system does have some sort of ombudsman or some kind of uh, patient advocate. And, and that's an office you should definitely utilize um, because their goal is to advocate for you. Uh, often your, the insurance companies also have an advocacy system, so you can do that. And then there are many patient safety organizations who can advise you. Um, you can find, find them online. Uh, you can also call your local uh, board of health, department of health, um, the professional organizations that license doctors and nurses. They can be of some, some assistance. It's not easy because it is very fragmented. Um, so I, I do advise people, you know, to keep notes if you can. And often when you're sick, it's hard to, but it's good to if you can have some sort of paper trail of what's happening so that when you go and, and talk to someone, you have some, oh, when did this happen? When did that happen? That can be very helpful. But it, it, the system is not designed to make it easy to get information. Although now with the new CARES Act, um, the 21st Century Cures Act, you um, have access to your medical records you know, uh, electronically. So take advantage of that. You should be able to read the notes that your doctors write. And if you see something that doesn't seem right, you could say, hey, you know what? I don't actually have epilepsy that, you know, that, or, or I did when I was a kid, but I don't have it now. Can you please correct the record? So you can look at the medical records yourself and suggest corrections. You do in your book state some of the responsibility falls on the patient. You outline some steps that patients should take and speak up. Can we just touch on that a little further? Yeah, you know, so I, I it's very hard because the patient is often not in the position to be doing the advocate the advocacy because they are by definition the patient and often they're sick or feverish or or, or terrified but it, it helps if you can to have someone with you whether you're going to an office visit or in the hospital not everyone has that luxury but if you can having someone by your side who can take notes ask the questions you know it's your it, uh, it's your right to have that information explained to you and if the doctor or nurse seems too busy then you say well when is the time that I can get this information because you shouldn't need to accept, you know, they don't have time to explain it to me. You should know every medication they're giving you, someone's got to take the time to explain what it is, why you're getting it, uh, and what are the possible side effects. If you're, you know, being sent down for a CAT scan, why am I getting this test? And also, how good is this test for diagnosing what I have? You know, uh, they should be able to defend that decision. Um, ask questions. Um, I, I do, you know, recommend that you recognize though that, um, at the very least that your doctors and nurses are working very hard and they're probably very overworked. So it, it's not a bad idea to acknowledge, you know, the people working hard and be appreciative for things that go well. I think most doctors and nurses often only get the complaints and not the compliments. So, you know, throw them a rope and acknowledge the, the stuff that's going well, but, but be persistent. It, it is your right to do that. And, and if you're not getting answers, then the patient advocate should be able to help you with that. Yeah, you know, one thing is a patient, uh, that I don't quite understand. And you bring up that the original study cited the amount of medical uh, error or the people dying of medical error in the United States is the equivalent of 
one and a half jumbo jets crashing every day. So they made the analogy to airplanes, but then it got me thinking, well, in regard to error, you know, we know airlines records, they're very transparent. We can look them up online and they're how dangerous or safe they are. Why don't we have that level of transparency when we are researching, say, a surgeon? Right. You know, it, it's, it's, you, you are correct. And I think we want transparency. The problem is it's also complicated. So for example, in New York State, they began at some some years ago publishing the mortality rate of different cardiovascular surgeons. So you want the surgeon with the least the lowest mortality rate. Of course, once they did it, what did surgeons stop, start doing? They stopped taking sick patients, right? Because if you take complex patients, your mortality rate is going to be higher. So it actually worked against patients by, um, not that doctors would gain the system, but why would you do something that makes you look bad? So um, doctors started taking fewer and fewer of these very sick patients. So the we don't yet have a really good way to, cor to correct this these numbers for the situation. Right. If you operate on very, very sick and elderly patients, your mortality rate is going to be higher. If you only operate on 20 year olds who are perfectly healthy, you'll have a perfectly you know, record. But that's not really, really accurate. You know, um, one example for diabetes control, we often uh, have the statistics of what percentage of your patients have their sugar control, their A1C under eight or whatever measure we use. But um, if you think about it, like I have a couple of patients who don't want to take their insulin. They don't like it. Um, and so their their sugar level is very high all the time. So it, quote, makes me look bad. Now, if I'm really nasty to them and they leave, I now look better because I've gotten rid of my patients who have not controlled sugar. But if I try hard to bring them into my practice and be a good doctor and get them to come, which I think is better medicine, I actually look worse because my numbers look worse. So we have these numbers, but they're very hard to interpret. If we just look at them like, you know, the number of stars on an Amazon review for a microwave, it doesn't convey the full you know, situation. Maybe you want someone who has a low number because it reflects they take on complex patients and take the time. Um, there was a, a colleague of mine in, in, in her practice, uh, she was in Massachusetts, she looked up her ratings and she was not rated as a top rated doctor. And she was a little, you know, concerned and a little hurt because she thinks she's pretty good. So she dug in the statistics and she found out that her low rating came from being inefficient. And when she dug deeper than that, her inefficiency was that she took too much time with her patients. And that because that changes the denominator, became inefficient. But in fact, that's the doctor you want who takes the extra time. But it, at the very top level, you see, oh, this doctor is not rated a, you know, an A doctor. I don't want them. So it's very hard to make these ratings and, and numbers accurate and helpful because there's so many other things that come into the equation. So I don't quite have the answer, but that's part of it. But there has to be a way to contextualize the data to make it meaningful. Um, and we don't have an easy way to do that. And I think airplanes are very standardized and human beings are not, right? Not every patient's equivalent. Most passengers who walk in a plane are equivalent. They have X weight, this many bags, and it doesn't matter who they are. They're all the same in a plane. But walking into a hospital or to a doctor's office, they're very different. Their illnesses are different. Their you know, financial situation, their social situation, um, their concerns, their risks, their genetics are different. So, so many things go into the pot. And the same with, you know, the doctor giving the care. Are you working in a rural area without many resources? Are you working in a high-end academic center with, we do too much medicine, we over-treat patients. So there's so many things that go into the equation that make those data more difficult to be meaningful for patients. Not trying to dodge, but that's the reality. It's a complex situation and there's not an easy answer. Um, but what's great about your book is how you dissect through these various issues that in fact may be and probably are affecting outcomes. And you offer some ideas and different ways of looking at things. And one that I thought was really interesting is the need for silence. Yes. And I think one of the mm -hmm. things we don't have much time for is time to think. And that's critical. You know, patients have complex situations and we're so pressed for time that we just do the fastest thing. And if we actually stopped and thought about it, analyze the situation, discuss it with colleagues, we might come up with a better plan. We may do fewer tests because we really thought about it, but there's really no time for that in, in, in medicine. I was, um, I had a patient I was relaying in, in the book who walked in on a Monday morning with a prescription from another physician saying, you know, 
rule out adrenal insufficiency um, um, and rheumatoid arthritis, two very complex illnesses. Um, and I had my 20 minutes with him. He's got his other illnesses that are, you know, many chronic diseases. And I thought I could just, you know, order a thousand blood tests, you know, and I'll get it off my plate. But if I sat and thought about it, maybe I don't need as many tests, but I couldn't think about it. I really had to go back and spend an hour at another time and then come up with a really rational plan. But I can't do that for every patient because there's no allotment for that. But if I had that, I probably could, I, I know I could be a better doctor and I probably could be a more cost-effective doctor by not randomly ordering everything in the book, but actually thinking it through. And I think our patients would get better care. We'd actually be more efficient if we gave doctors and nurses a, a bit more time to think and consider and contemplate and, and talk with our patients to, you know, get the patient's viewpoint, you know, how risk averse is the patient? How much does the patient want to do these things? Do they understand the trade-off between the different, you know, testing strategies? That takes time. And we don't, you know, we don't, time is not reimbursable very much in medicine. We reimburse for procedures and things. We don't reimburse for doctors and nurses to sit and talk with their patients or consider or just think on their own. And if it's not reimbursed, you know, it isn't going to happen. There's um some few kind of no real uh, sequence to the next questions. Uh, but in the book, you talk about adverse events, medical error, and unintended consequences. Can you break down, is there a difference between those three? And what is it? Medical error is, I think, our classic, someone has made a mistake. You should have done A, it's very clear, and you did B. Um, now, adverse events are just bad things that happen. You may have done the right thing, but a bad thing happened. So, so, um, and we often, and sometimes it makes more sense just to speak about ad adverse events, you know, things that happened to, you know, the patients that they you know, took their medication, they had an allergic reaction. That's an adverse event. It wasn't an error, but it was still, you know, and, and, you know, that's the harm to the patient, whether it was intentional or not. Um, and then unintended consequences. These are things that happen. We don't necessarily, you know, plan for them. Um, so a good example is in the emergency room, we know that patients with pneumonia, you know, getting antibiotics quickly is beneficial. So they set a target of that when patients come in with suspected pneumonia to get antibiotics within 60 minutes, that was the target. And now you're being graded on it. So everyone shot to do that. Now, of course, lots of patients got antibiotics who didn't need them and were overtreated. And those were unintended consequences. Some of those patients will get harmed from that. They'll have allergic reactions. They'll have you know, kidney problems, all kinds of things can happen with antibiotics if you don't need them, you'll get resistant infections. Those are unintended consequences and they're adverse events or patient harm. They're not errors, but because we try to standardize, we focus on one thing, we had, which was a good thing, get antibiotics quickly for pneumonia, we had unintended consequences that harmed patients. And we have to really think about that every time we have some kind of patient safety intervention. Um, you know, you, in the book, you talk about malpractice and missed diagnosis, but then it made me think, is there such a thing as over-treating? I guess it depends on the disease, but think about say prostate or thyroid cancer where active surveillance is becoming more common, but is there such a category as over-treating? Oh, there absolutely is an over-diagnosis. And I think prostate cancer is a great example. I mean, if you were to do um, autopsies in every man who dies at any age, especially in the elderly, you'll probably find you know, very tiny prostate cancers in their prostate, but they happily died of their stroke or heart attack or old age, and it never bothered them. Now, if we screen for them at an early age and find them, okay, now we have them. Well, what do we do? We're, we feel obliged to treat. So let's say there's a thyroid, the a prostate cancer that was destined to do nothing, but just hang out till you died of your heart attack. But now you treat it and you cause incontinence for the rest of their life you've given someone an adverse outcome and you haven't necessarily helped them because it, it wasn't going to change their life. So we, we have a lot of over-treatment. Um, now that we have more aggressive screening, we don't always know for treating things that are actually going to benefit people. And it's a hard concept to latch onto because you got a cancer, you better treat it. But people say, I had a mammogram and saved my life. Well, we don't really know that. You know, there are many small things, you know, sub-cancers, we can call them, that if left alone would have done nothing but we treat them and you're alive. So did it save my life? Well, you might think so, but we actually don't necessarily know. And so sometimes we do a lot of harm um, in the overdiagnosis and, and overtreatment because prostate cancer isn't one thing. It's 
likely several different things and same with breast cancer. And we have to be more sophisticated um, in, in stratifying these, which of these, and we'd like to know which, because some prostate cancers will kill you and we want to get those early and treat them aggressively, but we don't always know the difference between them. We often treat things that wouldn't have harmed you, but you still get the, uh, the side effects, the bad outcomes. As a patient, I think it's so valuable uh, to read your book because it does inspire thought and questions that maybe wouldn't be on the table before reading your book. For example, one thing I thought of is, you know, if you're a patient and you have harm done to you, there's that limitation you cite two years before you can bring a case. But sometimes you don't discover that there was an error made until maybe five years later. I mean, for example, I had a rhinoplasty with my nose when it was broken. Uh, but it was a doctor six years later during an exam who figured out that there was an error. Uh, you know, in that case, you're, I guess, out of luck as a patient if uh, errors discovered beyond the two years. Right, and those statute of limitations, that, that's actually state-wide, and they vary from state to state. But yes, there are a lot, a lot of things, and, and of course, this is, happens a lot in, in issues of legal. Um, yeah, there are, are limitations in different states, and that can be a very difficult uh, thing. Now, sometimes there are errors that don't cause harm, what we might call a, a near miss. An error happened, you know, the wrong dose was given or the wrong antibiotic, but the patient did fine. You know, it, is that an error? Should the patient be told about that? You know, it's, it's a complex thing. Um, a lot of patients say, yeah, I want to know about that. And some patients are like, you know, if it didn't cause any bad outcome, you know, I don't need to know all, you know, what's under the hood. And, it, and it's, you know, um, I, I had a case where uh, a patient was admitted when I was a resident for altered mental status. And I was told he's totally stable, labs fine, radiology fine, you know, just get him back to his nursing home, which I, I you know, went to do. And it turns out, though, he actually had a bleed in his brain. And mm -hmm. I missed it because I didn't look at the CAT scan. Someone said radiology fine. I just took that. On, and on. But uh, during the night, another resident saw them. The patient went to the OR and had the bleed drain. So the patient did fine. You know, the, the care wasn't impacted. Someone else caught it. Um, but I'd still made an error. If I, if I had sent the patient home, he could have died. But because the patient hadn't gone home yet, he was able to be treated. So yes, it was an error, but the patient wasn't harmed. Should I have told the patient? Now, of course, as a, as a young doctor, I you know I was so humiliated and ashamed of the error, I, I couldn't imagine dragging myself to the patient's bedside and telling them. Now I think I, I would, um, or at least explain to them you know the sequence of events. But it was very hard to conceptualize how one does that. And, and the interesting thing, we call that a near miss, but of course it's still an error, but those near misses don't really get counted, which is, mm -hmm. you know, in research, we don't count those near misses, but that's really important because the near misses, that's just the error waiting to happen for the next patient. It's the minefield where we want to be, you know, in, interacting and interfering with that. Um, and I think that points to the role of uh, emotions um, because it took me 20 years to talk about that error, talk about mm -hmm. a statute of limitations, that's how long it took because I was so ashamed of you know, doing, um, uh, you know, short changing my patient. And so, if you imagine, you know, all the near misses that happen and our human instinct to be ashamed about error, we don't admit it. Then the researchers never know about them. We don't know where to be, you know, allocating our resources to address the problem. So we really have to think about the emotional side as well. Now that the your book has been read by many and has excellent reviews on Amazon. Um, looking back now, if you were to add a chapter or more information, what would it be? I, I think I'd want to uh, uh, pull in um, more more patient stories. You know, I had a few and and, and they were obviously very right. extreme, you know, yeah. partly because that's what is interesting to read about. I mean, who wants to read about, oh, my cholesterol level was 200, it should have been 180, it's not that interesting. But I think that the smaller, errors or shortcomings are in fact the more common ones. And I think the ones I ended up illustrating are, are very dramatic and maybe don't aren't representative, although they do make the points, that's not what most patients experience. So I think I would love to include if there was a way to do it. I mean, the book was much longer in the manuscript, but I got I had to get cut down to publishable form. There's lots, there's lots to more to write. And I think also the experiences of the doctors and nurses who have made errors and to talk more about what they've experienced and, and how they've dealt with that and how they sort of make restitution to their patients if they're able to. Well, I enjoyed the book and I listened to it on Audible and it was uh, my company while walking 
in the evenings and very enjoyable. Uh, just a couple more questions here, Dr. Ofer, before we say farewell. But um, if there was a large sign posted at every hospital doctor's break room, what would it say? Probably wash your hands. I think that's probably the one intervention that will at least infection. And certainly now in COVID, we're more aware of that. But just to wash your hands. And I think mm -hmm. if I could put a second thing is stop and think. Mm -hmm. Because that's one thing we just don't have time to do. Mm -hmm. Stop and think. And I, that sort of moment to clarify what we're doing, why we're doing it. Is this the best thing? Does the patient understand what's going on? Those moments to think, mm -hmm. I think, would be very valuable. Maybe it's time to screen doctors and ask if they practice yoga or meditation. Um, if there was a large sign posted at every patient's waiting room, what would it say? Um, it would be, uh, ask your questions, but um, prioritize them. Because sometimes patients come in with a list of 50 questions. And of course, if I have 50 questions, by definition, it's going to be superficial, so you can't get to them all. So really pick the two or three important ones because you want them in depth. You don't want the doctor to gloss over what you have to do with 50 questions. So ask your questions, but prioritize. Um, and then ask, if I have another question, how do I get in touch with you? Because you do have a right to get the other question answered, but maybe you can't get them all answered in your one 15-minute visit. Last question. Uh, what book do you gift most to others other than your own? <laughs> um, I don't give my own. Uh, <laughs> um, the books I love to give, um, well, there's a, a couple. So for nonfiction, I really always recommend My Own Country by Abraham Verghese, which was his experience as a young infectious disease doctor in small town America during uh, the AIDS, early AIDS epidemic. It's a really wonderful mm -hmm. book. And then for fiction, I really uh, love uh, Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I think the magical realism just appeals to me because it allows us to sort of blend um, what's really happening with the emotional side uh, of our reality, and which I think is, is true in real life too. And although it's, it's magical, it's still very realistic. So I, I love those two books. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ofri, thank you very much. Uh, you, the links, all the links we talked about and information for those listening will be provided in the show notes. But thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.